Okay, well, we've been going through uh, a series that uh, I've entitled just really simply Reach, right? And uh, we want to reach people in the community. We want to reach people in the world, and I feel that there is a way, a proper way to do that. There's, uh, it seems like there's, all, there's a right way and there's a wrong way, and uh, a lot of people do it the wrong way, and we don't want to be part of that. We want to do it the right way. We want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, several weeks ago, we started, and I gave you uh, kind of the outline of, uh, of this message, of this series of messages. And I started off by telling you we're going to talk about the man, that's the individual, and the equipping of that person to go out into the world and share the gospel. We're going to talk about the man as a whole and uh, what is required of him. Then we're going to talk about the mission. What is the mission, right? We have to know we have to not just have the, the individual, but then he has to have a, a plan, kind of a, uh, how is he going to, what's, what's his plan? What, why is he going into the world? What is the mission? And I mentioned to you, it's the Great Commission. It's going out and, uh, and uh, sharing the gospel with other people. So we talk about the man, the mission, and then we're going to talk about the method. The method. How is he to carry out this mission, right? This isn't mission impossible. This is mission possible. We can, we can do this. We can do this. We can go take the gospel uh, that has been given to us and go share that with other people. So we're talking about the man, the mission, and the method. And uh, for the last two weeks, I've talked about these titles I've given to you, having, having a clear head, right? Having a clear head was the first message, and that dealt with a, a lot about just perspective as a whole, having a clear head. Then we talked about having a caring heart last week, and, and uh, probably one of the most important things is having a caring heart. And uh, we expect to go out and reach people with the gospel, but if you don't care about those people, we're not going to reach them. You got to love those people you want to lead to the Lord, right? So we have a, a, a clear head, a caring heart, and, and uh, this morning we're talking about having clean hands and uh, apparently, my son told me that the bulletin at the top says, says last week's message, so you can just cross that out if that's true, and you can just put, having clean hands, having clean hands. Uh, I think that by way of introduction, let me start by saying this, that, that uh, reaching people effectively with the gospel has something to do with having clean hands. And when I say having clean hands, I mean purity, purity. Now, I know that's kind of taboo in a world where everything is kind of gone immoral, right? Where things nowadays, they're just, uh, people don't really care about morality. They don't care about purity. But reaching people with the gospel has something to do with purity, has something to do with, with having clean hands and uh, purity and persuasion go hand in hand. And one guy said this, in great measure, according to the purity and perfections of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. He goes on to say that a holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. A holy minister. We need holiness in the church. We need people who are living right for the Lord. You cannot lead others to freedom while you're in bondage yourself. And a good minister is always looking to be like Jesus Christ. I've heard for years people say things like, there are some of those saints out there who are too, uh, too heavenly minded to be too earthly good. They're too heavenly minded. And this is a pet peeve of mine, and I've mentioned it to you before, I'm sure, but it seems to me that, that, that you're just going to have to apologize to Jesus then. Because uh, the way I look at it, the way I look at it, the only people that are any earthly good are those that are heavenly minded. And the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you'll be. I had a friend of mine who, uh, who talked about purity when it came to water. He, uh, he, delivered, uh, he delivered for Hinkley, Hinkley Springs, I think is what it is, for like 20 years, delivered bottled water to people. 
And we got into a little, little uh, uh, debate one time, and I, we were in the kitchen in here, and, and um, he comes around the corner, and I say, hey, I said, uh, Jeremy, can I get you a glass of water? And he says, uh, he says, as long as it's not from the tap. And I said, what do you mean not from the tap? You know, I mean, it's not, it's not like it's polluted. And, uh, and he, says, he says, I only drink bottled water. I only drink things that, 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 that don't come from the tap. And uh, I said, well, come on, Jeremy. I said, that's why they have water treatment plants. And he says, that's, that's what I thought until I started delivering bottled water to the water treatment plant. And, he, and I said, you did? He says, this is, I asked him, I had the same logic. I said, well, why am I delivering bottled water to the water treatment plant? And he says uh, that they responded, and they said, well, that's just a big misnomer because the water treatment plant treats only 2% of the water for human consumption. And he said, I'm like, wait, 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 what? He says, yeah, I don't, even, I don't drink anything unless it's in a bottle. I'd rather have the BPA than to have the, all the pollutants that the, that the water treatment plant put into it. And I said, you're kidding. He says, he says no. He says, I, I, just, I just don't want all the fluorides and all that other stuff. And, and he, says, he says, I only drink things that are pure. He said, purity is important. I said, you know what, Jeremy? Purity is important. Purity is important. And your holiness has an impact on the success of others. When we're reaching people with the gospel message, if you are not living a right life, you will become ineffective. You become ineffective. So let's look at a couple things real quickly. First of all, the disaster, the disaster of impurity, the disaster of impurity. First of all, we, uh, we have a loss of value, don't we? Uh, when we become impure, there is a loss of value. Uh, silver, silver with uh, what's known as dross, which is the impure stuff that's mixed with silver as in the refining process that's extracted. Uh, silver, while it has that dross, is worthless. Uh, here is a silver, uh, a silver coin. These are, uh, these are called walking liberties. And uh, it has a face value of, uh, of a dollar, of a dollar. So you can actually take these coins, these uh, 0.999% silver coins, and actually spend these uh, silver coins at a, at a store because there's a face value of a dollar. It says on the, on the back side, I think it says, uh, silver, one dollar. So they're spendable. And uh, this probably looks like a, a proof coin and, and uh, came off of, the, off of the mint that way. They stamp them. They, do these, they, they set them aside. These are uncirculated. At least this one looks like it's uncirculated, I think, or Photoshopped, one of the two. And, uh, but it's a beautiful coin. Now, that coin actually has more value than $1. Uh, that coin, specifically right there, probably runs about $16 to $18 right now. Usually, they, they mark it up a little bit for, uh, for these uh, uh, walking liberties because they're, they're IRA acceptable, which it means nothing to you probably. But uh, the, the value is probably more like uh, $20 or $22 a coin. Now, this is what's known as dross. That is the, the slag and, and all of the nasty impurities that are, that are taken out of uh, this uh, process of refinement. So it, it starts like that, in a sense. It's just a big, it's actually worse than that. It's, it's more just a nasty, big clump of, of, uh, of dirt, if you will, mined out from the earth. And, and then through the refining process, they take away the dross, and you're left with this. And in uh, Proverbs 25.4, it says this, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. You take away all of the impurities, and now you have something that's valuable. But with all of the impurities, it loses its value. You see, there's, the, the coin is worth almost nothing, in a sense, if it is full of all of these impurities. So take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. The dross is the corruption, and the impurities are what corrupt you from having a greater value. So with impurities, with impurities, we have a, a loss of value. And to illustrate this, there were two students who were walking along the streets in London. One of the students pointed to a suit hanging in a window and said, what an illustration. There was a sign, and on that sign it read, slightly soiled, greatly reduced in price. Uh, that's it exactly, he continued. 
And this is what he said. We get soiled by gazing at a vulgar picture, reading a coarse book, or allowing ourselves a little indulgence in dishonest or lustful thoughts. And so when the time comes for our character to be appraised, we are greatly reduced in value. Our purity, our strength is gone. And he says this, that deviation from the path of right may greatly reduce our usefulness to God and our fellow man. We lose our value the more impurities we have in our life. We lose our testimony. And friends, can I tell you that we want to go out there and we want to win the world. We want to talk to people about Jesus and we have a a polluted testimony before them. How effective do you think you're really going to be if people look at you and say, but that Christian right there has a lot of impurities in his life. That Christian right there, he doesn't think well. He doesn't live right, and and he's involved in all the things we're involved in. How good do you think your testimony is going to be? Webster's Dictionary puts a testimony this way. It is a first-hand authentication of a fact or evidence. It's an outward sign, and an open acknowledgement, a public profession. So you're going to go out there and you're going to profess Christ and have a tremendous amount of impurities. Well, let me ask you this question. How can you tell others about what God can do for them if you have no evidence in your life about what God has done for you? A reduced effectiveness. Filthy hands create a faulty testimony, doesn't it? You see, people create value in what they see. They create value in what they see. It's just true. We have a story in in 1 Samuel 16 of uh, of kind of this exact thing. And uh, Samuel was to go anoint the new king, and and, uh, Saul was being deposed of his throne, and and, uh, David was going to be anointed king. And uh, on his journey, he finds this guy, and his name was, uh, I think his name was Eliab, and uh, he meets this guy, and surely he had, uh, he had all of the, the appearance of the next king. And, and so uh, Samuel was going to go anoint this guy. And, and the Lord said, it says here, unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And we can say all sorts of things like, yeah, but we shouldn't be judging one another. And you know what? Can I tell you, the Bible says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The Bible never once says, it never once says, don't judge another person. It gives guidelines by which we judge. And can I say this as well? That when you go out there and you discern between good and bad behavior, you have past judgment. And that's okay. That's discernment, and that's good. The Bible says that whatsoever, the way you judge, you will be judged. You'll be judged by the same measure that you judge. So we have to be careful how we judge. The Bible talks about not judging someone's motives, but it never says not to judge. Here's when I, when I read this, this is what I say. I say that the world is watching you. The world is watching whether or not what you say is true about your God. And if we go out there with filthy hands, if we go out there with an unclean testimony and a ton of impurities, they're going to look at us and say, this guy, he's he's, he's fake. This guy has no testimony. You see, I think effectiveness, effectiveness in our witness happens when we have clean hands. When we go out in the world and we say we have, a, we have an upright testimony before people, I think it's those people that God is using in a really significant way. You see, the world is watching and they're going to either believe you or disbelieve you. And we have to have a right testimony. So first of all, we lose our value. We lose our value. Secondly, uh, we lose our vigor. 
We lose our vigor. And that's just a, a, a nice fancy word for saying strength. We lose our strength, don't we? Now, Job 17.9, Job, we look at Job and we say, man, here's a guy who went through a lot of trials. This guy is uh, probably the, the worst off person you can possibly imagine. We think of somebody who's, uh, who has it rough, and, and uh, this guy here, he takes, the, he takes uh, first place, doesn't he? He takes first place. Been through a lot, lost his family and his health and his wealth and everything around him, and, and, uh, and he did not forsake God. And in Job 17, 9, we read this, that the righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. He that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. And as you go through trials in your life, and people watch you come through these trials, and you have clean hands, and you have a pure life, a pure testimony, a solid testimony before man, you'll get stronger and stronger. Your strength will increase when your testimony is strong. But the opposite is also true. The opposite is also true. Proverbs 24.10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. In a very real sense, impurity brings an imperity. Impurity brings an imperity been in construction a long time. And uh, I can't tell you how many times something has wound up in my eye that should not be there. There's one thing that should be in my eye, and that's my eye. And uh, whether it's uh, cutting something or, uh, I don't know, uh, seems like it always happens when I'm cutting something. <laughs> I don't know. I'll be looking up at the ceiling, maybe painting, and something will fall into my eye. And and I've had this happen numerous times, and, and the first thing that happens is uh, you flinch, and you try to get it out, and you, you, you pick at your eye, and you try to get that, that, that uh, impurity out. And before long, your eye starts to hurt. It starts to turn red. Your eye starts to water. I think that's a natural reaction. I'm not crying. I just have something in my eye. And, uh, and uh, it's not long until you have impaired vision where your vision starts to go a little blurry, doesn't it? And you can't see like you ought to be able to see. Now, why do you have that in parity? It's because of some sort of impurity that is in your eye. We have little strength when we have a lot of impurity. We get weaker and weaker. We don't get stronger and stronger. I'm not sure one solid Christian out there, I wouldn't be a solid Christian, I'm, I'm not saying one Christian out there that has all this impurity in his life who feels like he's just getting stronger and stronger. If anything, he's getting weaker and weaker. Psalm 18, 20 to 24 says, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Now, that right there is so cool. Righteousness is, re is rewarded. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Verse 22, for all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. God will reward us. The cleaner the vessel, the greater the vigor. The more strength that you have, the more reward you have, the more blessing that you have. And let me say this too, that we bring this imperity on ourselves. We bring it on ourselves. We can't. We can. We can maybe go out there and try to blame our 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 brother or blame our sister or blame our mom or our dad and and say, but it's not my fault. Maybe the devil made me do it. And and say that I I just don't have the strength I used to have. I don't have the vigor. 
And I just don't feel I have the value anymore. I have all this impurity that seeped into my life. And you actually allowed that into your life. It didn't just seep in there. You, you allowed that in. We chose that impurity. This isn't someone else's fault. D.L. Moody said this, I have never met a man who has given me as much trouble as myself. And I think we can all say amen to that. The trouble that we're in, we have brought that on ourselves, haven't we? And so the reason that our strength is small and our value is less than it ought to be is our fault because we don't have clean hands. Impurity is a disaster. It leads to no rest, less value, and little strength. But there is a deliverance of purity, isn't there? Secondly, the deliverance of purity. There's deliverance that only comes through purity. Uh, impurity brings sorrow, it brings sadness. It, uh, people are always wondering when they're going to get caught or if they're going to get caught. And Isaiah 57, 20 really sums it up. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. You ever see a wicked person have peace? You ever see a, a person with a tremendous amount of impurity in their life just be able to just, just be at peace? It says here, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my Lord, to the wicked. They don't have peace, do they? If you don't have purity, you don't have peace. Here are two attributes that uh, get a boost with purity. Uh, first of all, we get a boost with, uh, we get increased boldness, don't we? We get increased boldness. Uh, righteous people are bold people. It's amazing uh, how many times over the years, uh, matter of fact, one year, uh, one, uh, uh, one church I was at, rather, uh, they, they said that the pastor seemed, uh, I can't remember the word, seemed proud or something. And, and I had to examine the life of this minister, and I just thought to myself, I don't think he's proud. I think he's bold. I think that this is a, a confident minister. And I think he lived a life that was pure. He had a solid testimony. But righteous people are bold people. Proverbs 28.1, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I love that verse. Are bold as a lion. And the reason I think that the wicked are always fleeing is they're always wondering when they're going to get caught. They're always afraid of the consequence for their sin. There's no wonder they're not at peace. They're worried about the consequence for their sin. It's no wonder there's no rest. It's no wonder there's no peace. You know, we've said before, I think it was Peter Dynica who said, uh, more, more, uh, more prayer, more power. More prayer, more power. But I think the more pure you are, the more power you'll have. The more pure you are, the more power you'll have. You don't have to worry. You don't have to look over your shoulder. You don't have to wonder if my testimony is shot or not. You don't have to wonder if, if, if the life I'm living right now is going to be rewarded from the Lord or am I going to be just concerned all the time about, about uh, not being effective for God. Now, this doesn't mean that, uh, that those people who are, who are less bold aren't living right. And it doesn't mean that those people that are more bold are living right, because, friends, it goes both ways. What I'm just simply saying is that the more pure you are, the more power you'll have. Now, the gospel really is the power. We understand that. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not Joe Huss. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not Dana Huss. It's not Josh or Ben Huss. It's not me. It's not you. It's the gospel. But let me say this, though. As you give the gospel, you are accessing the Holy Spirit in your life. And the Holy Spirit is working 
in your life and through your life. And if you are hindering the Holy Spirit's work because you are an impure person, you're not going to be effective. You're not going to be effective. We see a great example of this in Acts 4.13 of someone who was bold, two people, Peter and John. They began to preach about the gospel. And it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Two individuals who spent time with God. And I tell you what, if you're spending time with God, you are walking in the light as he is in the light. There is a fellowship there. There is a purity there. If you are spending time with Jesus, you're going to be powerful and you're going to be bold. And such was the example of Peter and John. They were bold because they had spent time with our Lord. And I tell you, it's amazing to me how many times I see an effective witness for Christ and I say, man, now that guy is spending time with his Lord. And then someone else maybe on the other side who who maybe doesn't have the power that he should have, doesn't have the value that he ought to have, doesn't have the vigor that he should have because of unclean hands, because he's living an impure life, and of course you're not going to be a good testimony. But then you have someone over here that, that is living a good life, that does have a lot of power, that has boldness, strength, and you say, now, man, now that guy... Something's different about him. Something's different about his testimony than the testimony of others. And what's different is they're living a life that honors God. So we have increased boldness. And lastly, we have increased behavior. We have increased behavior. Our behavior actually gets better. Our good behavior uh, is it builds good behavior. A pure life is, uh, is proper living, isn't it? A pure life is proper living, and proper living is persuasive. And so you live a good life, you live a a life of integrity, one of honesty and purity, and things, uh, things just seem to go better, don't they? And your testimony gets stronger and stronger, and you become more bold, and you're able to communicate effectively to people and share Christ with them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 3 says this, Furthermore, when we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. I love that. The will of God is our sanctification. You know what sanctification is? That's purity. That's holiness. That's being set apart for God. One commentator said this, it is God's clear will that his people be holy. The word can mean a state of being set apart from sin. Set apart from sin to God, or the process of becoming dedicated to God. And this dedication to God is a, is a progressive thing. Salvation is a, is a once-for-all thing, but sanctification is a process that takes time. And we are continually being sanctified, made like our Lord, the more we submit to Him. And the more we submit to Him, the more we become like Him, the better behaviors we'll have, and then the more we'll be like Him. And it just keeps building on itself over and over and over again. We have to have a good testimony. We have to have clean hands if we want to reach people. God wants us to be separate from sin, so is 2 Corinthians 7.1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Anything that is impure in your life, all of the things that are maybe besetting sins for you, things that trouble you, things that keep you bound up where you cannot lead others to freedom, lay them aside. Let us cleanse ourselves from them. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. That's what it says. We need to set aside all of those things that are are keeping us from having the value that we ought to have. 
We don't want impurity in our lives. We don't want sin in our lives. We don't want pollution. Nobody wants to drink from, from uh, well, in Jeremy's case, from the tap, but nobody wants to drink from polluted waters. And nobody wants to eat from dirty hands. So it's our responsibility as we go out and reach other people to make sure that we are living a life that pleases God. And I think that the vast majority of Christians are not living as pure life as they could. I'd venture to guess that all Christians are not living as pure life as they could. And if that is actually true, then none of us are as effective witness as we could be. We all have sin in our lives. And we all need to live a life that pleases the Lord. We have increased behavior. The more pure that we are, the better our behavior will be. In Psalm 24, 1 to 5, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that and all they that dwell therein. So that basically says all the stuff you think is yours actually belongs to God. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Watch this. Who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord. How do you receive a blessing from God? One, having clean hands. Two, having a pure heart. If I was to do a survey today, how many people believe they're as blessed as they could be, I bet everybody would say that I'm probably not as blessed as I could be. And the reason we're not as blessed as we could be is uh, because our behavior is not what it ought to be. And I'm not saying we live a pharisaical life. I'm not saying that everything on the outside looks good and inside we're just wretched people. What I'm saying is that we need to be right with our Lord. And being right with the Lord starts with salvation. And then the process of sanctification can happen. Then we can begin to grow in the Lord and have purity and have clean hands. And salvation begins when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. We were at this prayer breakfast the other day and... uh, Governor Scott Walker gave, uh, gave uh, the gospel several times. Kind of, he kind of embedded it into his, into his uh, message, and it was really neat. And he could, have, uh, he could have come out there and walked on eggshells and not really said what he wanted to say or maybe had said something that he didn't mean, but he went out there and he, he talked about Christ and about his shed blood and about what the Lord did for all of us. And I'm just so thankful that we have a God who loved us so much he laid down his life for us. You know, Jesus did that for you. He came to this earth and he died on the cross to pay for your sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That's the payment. The payment that must be made for your sin is death. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin. He didn't come to get baptized for your sin. The wages of sin is not water baptism. The wages of sin is not church membership. The wages of sin is not living a pure life. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for your sin. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not of water baptism. It's not of works. It's not of walking an aisle, praying a prayer, raising a hand, giving money to the church, being a good person, living a pure life. For by grace are you saved through faith. Aren't you so glad it's easy? It's easy for us. 
Now, Jesus gave his life. It wasn't easy for him. But I'm so thankful that Jesus gave his life for us and that through simple faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, we can go to heaven when we die. It's simply when we, in the quietness of our minds, say something simple like this, Lord, the best I know how, I believe, I believe Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for my sin. I believe that, Lord. I'm placing my faith in him alone for my salvation. I believe that. And if you do that, you will spend an eternity with the Lord. When Rolando's brother was dying on Thursday night, about 15, 20 people in the room, and and, uh, I don't know, I was probably three feet from his head, and and I could have just whispered to him. I could have whispered. I could have said, uh, you know, Jamie, Jesus died for you. But I didn't. I said it loud enough so all the family members around could hear. Now, I don't know if Jamie trusted Christ as a Savior that night. I wish there was some indication. I wish there was some big response. But we don't know that. One of the fellows that came around to the other side was another guy that I had led to the Lord about two years ago, which was Rolando's brother, which was really a, a, nice, a nice thing. He was there. He came around the other side, and, and uh, I hope that he trusted Christ. I hope that Jamie trusted Christ before he died, but you can trust Christ before you die because you can do it right in this room right now simply by placing your faith in Christ alone as your Savior.